Thank you for joining us this Tuesday for the East Tennessee Multifamily Meetup. Today we have Wes Mabry of 1245 Consulting uh, joining us. Wes is a cost segregation guy out of Texas, travels around most of the U.S., right? Are you kind of coast to coast? So yeah, we, we personally worked with Wes a couple of times, uh, had him on the podcast. Uh, it's a pretty popular subject. Um, one of those things you don't touch a lot until you need it. So it's kind of difficult, I think, for us as active investors to experience it and then go back and realize why it's so important to us. So we'll just bring in somebody that does it for a living to talk about it a little bit at length. So Wes, uh, I think he's got a, a bit of a presentation lined up that we're going to run through and, uh, and then go into some general Q&A. And uh, Wes, you were happy to take questions along the way. Was that fine or? Uh... Totally cool. You okay. About covering anything that you want to jump in on, fire away. I'm happy to answer your question. Don't, uh, don't need you to sit through the whole thing to, to chime in. So Yeah, and we're not, a, we're not a huge group. So I, I, I think it would be fine yeah. if, if you got a question to you know, unmute yourself and, and just kind of chime in that way. If, if uh, you're more comfortable dropping into, into the chat, I'll, I'll, I'll keep uh, tabs on that and, and ask for you at some point. So Wes, again, yeah, thanks, man. For joining us, please take it away. I think you can share. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, everybody, for uh, your time tonight. I'll uh, do my best to kind of inject some knowledge. Hopefully, you can take away a little bit of value. So, uh, my name is Wes Mabry. I am the owner of 1245 Consulting. I do only cost segregation studies. I started doing this in 2006 as a commercial real estate appraiser. I was doing only cost seg as a real estate appraiser. Um, did that for about 10 years, got hired away by an engineering firm on the East Coast, worked for them for a while. They kind of blended me into a sales role. I was taking meetings for the first time in my life and finding out that I was actually pretty good at fielding questions and working with clients. And then the light bulb started to turn on. Uh, and then when I saw the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017, usher in 100%, bonus depreciation for new and used assets. I started my own company and uh, left the W-2 life and haven't looked back. And it has been an absolutely amazing experience from top to bottom, um, learning about not only myself, but my profession. It's been a really cool thing. Um, what I've got planned for you guys today is just a walkthrough. I'll give you a quick history of CostSeg, like how it all started, where it all came from, what is this thing? Um, then I'll kind of jump into your chat for, for a minute and uh, we'll look at if you're going out into the marketplace and looking for a cost egg, how should you approach that? Uh, what should you expect? What should you come prepared with? And what should you expect to receive? Um, and then uh, we'll jump back into my chair and I've got a kind of a photographic walkthrough of an apartment. I understand that this is a, kind of a multifamily centric group, so I'll try to keep it geared towards that. If you've got your hand in some other assets, it definitely doesn't uh, exclude any of it. Uh, you can do it for any type of asset, but it's this uh, presentation is, it'll lean towards multifamily. So um, I'll go over you know, what I look at and for when I'm out on site and then what I do when I get back to the office and then what actually goes out to you. I've, uh, I've got a mock study ready for you guys to look at and we'll cruise through it and, and look into the data there. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, cost segregation, if you just have big familiarity with it, is a study that will go and analyze your building and break it up into different pieces. Some of these pieces you can depreciate more quickly than others. And in doing that, it allows you to take a book loss, a, to put a non-cash loss on your net operating income. So it's going to show that you lost some money that year without actually spending it. And then you'll pay less taxes based on that. You tax on your NOI, cost six study comes in and effectively lowers that for you and your partners if you're structured in, in, that, uh, in that fashion. So here's how it all kind of came to be. We fought two wars in the 40s and 50s, World War II, Korean War. And in doing that, 
Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard reference before the industrial war effort. That's, um, that is, it was quite literal. Industry was geared towards making tanks, making tires, making ammunition. It was a very specific kind of industry that we had to engage in as a country to conduct this effort. And once those wars concluded, we had this very heavy kind of monotonous asset class out there, industry, industrial, but its use was very limited. We were going to need to make tanks and bullets and helmets at, at a rapid scale anymore. And so the Kennedy administration got the idea that they would credit real estate investors if they would buy these assets and make them unique to their own trade or practice. And this became called investment tax credits, ITCs for short. Uh, Kennedy never got to sign it into law, Johnson did, and it kind of took off. People were taking advantage of it to buy a warehouse and you're baking cookies. Um, to make that warehouse unique to your kitchen, you need to bring in some plumbing, bring in some electrical, uh, do some ventilation, all those things you need to actually run a kitchen. Um, and as real estate investors tend to do, they got a little aggressive. They started claiming credits for things that weren't really making the building unique to what they did. So maybe they'll add in a rest, uh, sorry, rest room to a restaurant and try to take tax credits for the restroom. That's not really the spirit of it. Everyone's got to have a restroom. So these different asset classes began to get adjudicated through the court systems and they got very specific in what they would allow and what they would not allow. Uh, so we have long court case history of uh, substantiated items, uh, you know, what goes, what doesn't go. And then in the late eighties, uh, a hospital took the IRS to court, the court cases, Hospital Corps of America versus the IRS. And their stance was basically this. I've got this big building, but it is loaded with wires and cables and hoses that are unique to what I do as a hospital. And therefore, we're going to take all these unique items as personal property. And we're going to write them off quickly and we're going to do the structure completely differently. And the courts agreed with them. And that was a landmark case for COSEC because it took the theory of it and put it into practice and kind of got the thumbs up. Not so much just pieces now, but now we're talking about a theory of this belongs to me as a person, a legal person, a business, um, and, and not so much a, a building. And so we've got it now. It's been adjudicated a number of times. There's plenty of litmus tests, if you will, for what counts and what doesn't. So um, it's it's not a subjective thing. Now it's, it's rooted in a lot of case law. So um, where we're at now, uh, has varied over the years. Uh, George Bush W. was was the first one to give us bonus depreciation, which kind of takes those items that we've learned about through case law and and give you a little bit more in year one. I think he did something like 25%, but that was only for new construction. They, they you know, different administrations understand that construction, particularly in the real estate arena, it impacts a lot of jobs. And the more you can move it down the line, the more lawyers are working on it, title guys are working on it up front, you know, your brokers, your sales agents, but then it kind of shifts over to blue collar jobs, and tradesmen, plumbers, electricians, framers, things like that. Um, so incentivizing real estate construction has been a way of really kind of moving the economy along. Uh, Obama signed something like eight different iterations of bonus into law different percentages for different things. And then now we have, we're currently under Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 100% bonus depreciation. I mentioned it earlier, uh, kind of how it played a role in my career. And for the first time now, we see 100% bonus depreciation applied towards an asset, whether you built it or if you bought it. So it can be new or it can be used. And it's the first time we've ever seen it for something that's used. So. We kind of caught up now in the current state of affairs. Um, I'm going to take a minute to sit in your chair and say, all right, I've got a small apartment or a big apartment, and I, I want to engage a cost study. What do I need to do? Well, you can reach out 
to a provider and you're going to need to give them at minimum the street address and what you paid for the property. And they should be able to take that data and kind of throw some historical percentages at it. Like I've done hundreds and hundreds of apartments. They all tend to perform similarly in terms of five, seven, 15, and 27 and a half year percentages. I mentioned those numbers. Um, I just kind of want to focus on those for a second. They're asset class lives. And that's really what Caustic does. It breaks things up into buckets. And the big buckets are five year, those are your interior assets, like your flooring, your window covering, your uh, electrical hookups, uh, appliances, cabinets, things like that. And then your 15 year assets, that's outside your building, paving, parking, sidewalk, landscaping, street lights, stuff like that. And then the large bucket for apartment is 27 and a half. That's your structure, roof, framing, windows, walls, doors. So an experienced cost of provider should be able to take a look at some historical data, and apply that to your improvement basis. Your improvement basis isn't what you pay for. You got to back out land first. Land is non-depreciable. You're not making any more of it. Uh, so that's got to come off of your purchase price. And the best way and quickest way to do that is to just check and see what the county says. The county will have your improvement value and your land value and your total value. And whatever percentage that land makes up of the whole, just apply it to your purchase price. And there you go. You should have an improvement basis. Sometimes that's too high for an individual's case. Uh, but as experts in the market, you can arbitrarily throw a different percentage at it. If the county says it's 55, but you're kind of in a fringe area and you think, well, 55% land's too high, mine's closer to 40. You can do it, uh, but you should be prepared to defend it. That's uh, one thing that comes up in audit and it's, uh, you know, to go to an auditor and say, look, well, the county says it's you know, worth 35%. And I put 35% in here, they can't really, they, they don't have a leg to stand on. It's, it's ironclad. If you go with your own percentage, uh, have some comps, be able to substantiate it. Uh, you know, just a, a wild guess isn't, isn't the best thing to apply there. So um, let's do this. Let's, let's actually look at what, what a benefit estimate would look like for you guys. I've got one prepared. Uh, Kim, do you know, is my, is my screen on? Not yet. Let's go look look at it. Go. Let me know when it is and I'll, uh, I'll pop one up here and we can take a look at it. Uh, try now. I don't know if I had the control, but I just allowed multiple. Any luck, Wes? Um, but could you guys see my, uh, oh, hang on one sec. How are we doing? There we go. We're doing good now. All right, cool. So this is what my benefit estimate looks like. It's a one pager that I sent to clients. This is just a redacted one that I kind of made up. Um, and what we'll see here on the left is 21 million is your purchase price. The land value that I referenced We'll go right here and 5 million. And what's left over is your improvement basis. So this is all of the improvements to the land, the building, but also including like the parking lot and the sidewalks, swimming pool, whatever you got. The 16 million is the number we're gonna chop up or cost segregate. Um, you'll have a five-year estimate of value. And this is the interior portion, 18%. It's not bad for apartments. It's about what I'd find. It can go up or down from there, depending on a number of factors that we'll cover a little later in the walkthrough. Seven years is kind of a betweener category. Um, I'm not gonna give it a lot of attention. Mailboxes are in there, patio furniture is in there. Um, it doesn't really ever make up much of a study, but it's technically correct to have it. So I, I, I keep it uh, 15 year. Again, that's all the stuff outside the building, paving, parking, sidewalk, storm drainage. If you got it in my part of the country, that's a huge deal, very expensive asset class. Um, excuse me, item in an asset class. 7% uh, is not uncommon. The bigger your lot, the more parking you have, the more exterior amenities you provide. Some places have tennis courts, pools, multiple pools, all expensive stuff contributing to the 15-year bucket. 
27 and a half year, that's your structure. That's your doors, your windows, your walls. And in an apartment, it's not un, uh, uncommon to find about 73%, 70% in that uh, bucket. And you see it all totals there. So what are these long columns with a bunch of numbers? So this is a year by year look at five year, seven, 15, 27 and a half under cost segregation. Straight line is the method of depreciation where it's exactly what it is. It's the same amount every year, over and over, straight down the line. And it totals here at the bottom to 16 million, that's your improvement basis. And so what we're looking at here, total, uh, excuse me, cumulative cost seg total, because we're under bonus depreciation laws, this is a massive number. It is all of the five year, it is all of the seven year, it is all of the 15 year, and one sliver of the 27 and a half. It's all of these because the law that's in place now allows for everything under 20 years in life to be depreciated in a first year ownership. Let me look at, um, I prepared one that doesn't have bonus just to show you the contract. So this 1 million under non-bonus laws is one fifth of the five year, one seventh of the seven year, one fifteenth of the 15 year and one of the 27 and a half year buckets. That equals a little over a million. So our net benefit in this case, in a non-bonus case is half a million bucks more or less, 513K. But because we're using bonus, Four million bucks. That's a sweeping change. And so down here at the bottom of the sheet, I illustrate to my clients, you know, what the net is with first year. So that's your total cumulative minus the straight line. It's just kind of comparing the two. It's 4.1 million. Then I assume a 37% tax rate. That's top margin right now. This number can be everywhere. I mean, everyone has their own individual tax rate. Um, I work with a lot of clients on the higher end of the income spectrum. So I elect 37% just to show a top federal margin. I can dial this in for any client. It's just one little input. Um, it doesn't include any state. Like guys in New York and Cali, they're paying another 10, 12% on top of that. Um, so you apply your tax rate to this 4.1 million. It gives you a million five. That's your year one, first year tax savings using bonus. It's got my fee in there and a ratio. That's just kind of a, you know, sales fee stuff there. Um, earlier, I mentioned cost eggs showing a loss to your net operating income. This 4.1 million, that would be the loss. Applying your tax rate to it shows you what cost egg is worth to you in terms of dollars. This can also be spread out amongst partners in K1s. Um, so a lot of fluid stuff here can change with tax rates, can change with law. Uh, does anyone want to fire off a question on this? We'll come back to it at the end because it shows up again in the final report. These estimate numbers become final results. Uh, but if you've got a question about this, and it's a lot of numbers and a lot of data here. Um, but that's what a proposal should look like in a nutshell once you give the client I'm sorry, the cost seg provider, your street address and what you paid, they should be able to draw out a land value for you using tax records, gives you an improvement basis, and then apply some percentages to it. And that lets you know what you're gonna save by giving you a total loss and then putting on putting the tax rate. So that's kind of estimating in a nutshell, if you will. So Is one um, question, Go ahead. No, oh, TJ, you got it, man. Go. Sure. So one question I had is kind of a big picture. What? So looking at, I understand the accelerated depreciation from, you know, the first few years, but you get in the latter years of it and it's less than what you would be getting as far as taking off, you know, current tax income, I guess, ultimately. You're, you're, mm -hmm. So long term what's what's the long play with this you just is it the goal if you're doing this is you're always continually buying more so that way you always have new assets to accelerate the depreciation on like what what would be 
when is this most useful? What type of client, I guess is what I'm, I don't know if I'm asking that right, but. You are. Uh, so you are correct. In the later years, if you'll look at this right-hand column, well, I think I popped up the, uh, the non-bonus one. Let's get the bonus one back up. Yeah, so in this right-hand column, the net benefit, you'll see after year one, it's all gone. You ate up all the depreciation. That's kind of the, the purpose behind cost egg is to front end load your depreciation. So you're paying less taxes in that initial year of ownership. Now you can carry it forth. If this was just a single, uh, single asset that the, the client had, they may not be able to use up $4 million worth of uh, loss. Okay, you can right. carry that loss into later years. So uh, maybe you don't have to keep buying, but that is a strategy for some. Um, the play here can just be all over the place. You eat up all that depreciation in year one. You can then, um, you know, you've got a tax savings here of a million five. You can apply that to whatever your strategy might be. It could be a value add. You've got all this cash now that you didn't shovel over to Uncle Sam. You can apply towards your value add. Uh, you know, if it's a mark to market situation and you need to kind of let the asset marinate for a little bit. Maybe you want to get out in five years. Um, you'll have all that depreciation up front to enjoy in year one, but you can also carry it forward. For, it's like 20 years is the carry forward max. Um, so you can kick that depreciation out quite a while. Recapture comes into play. Talk about that at the end. It's a little bit involved, um, but you are correct. Costeg eats up the depreciation in the initial years of ownership. So there's really none left after year one, aside from what you can carry forward. And as far as what the strategy here with this particular property is, can be any strategy, um, but the tax deferment strategy and looking at this is to eat it up early. Time value of money kicks in here. You don't have to spend that savings. You can you know, of course, invest it or whatever you want. It's money on the table. You can use it to get into another deal. Um, does it answer the question? I can expand on it if, you, if we want to discuss it. Yeah, so, no, it, it, it does. I mean, like, I guess what would help, would help me is like an example. So Greg, how would, how do you use it? Is I mean, are you looking at a refi or a sell in five to seven years? Is that why you're yeah, I mean, generally, depreciation. I mean, generally, when we're using other investors, we're looking at a five or seven year old. To some extent, I mean, I look at it as like these are the laws as we know them today, and we don't know what they're going to be in the future. So, trying to take advantage of what's available now in the absence of future knowledge, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, That's a good point. And, you know, I don't expect cost said guys to get too deep into the CPA side of stuff because that's a whole nother specialty in and of itself. But generally speaking, you know, you're giving yourself and your partners as much tax advantage as you can to use out of the gate. And everybody's tax situation is very specific and it, you know, it just gives them an opportunity to Use it against, you know, you know, it can go against, I believe, your spouse's W-2 or, or whatever, or they carry it forward. So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I mean, essentially, you know, for, for most of the size deals that we do, Marshall, you know, feel free to chime in. You know, we're partners on stuff. The depreciation that any of our investors are going to receive is probably going to offset all of the income that they're going to get from this property. Yeah. A and lot of it though, I mean, in, in, in West or I don't know, but probably in a CPA, but the question is, is what can you do with that depreciation? How can you apply it? And that depends on a, on a number of factors. One is, are you or your spouse a real estate professional, quote unquote? And if they are, then you can take that depreciation and you can apply it to other passive income, I believe. The, right. the thing though is, is that if you're not, there's really, there's honestly not as much you can do. With it. And so it's kind of nice to have, but there's not, there's not a whole lot of uh, 
There's not as many applications for it. Hey, Marshall, actually, so partially incorrect what you said there, and I'm not trying to call you out, but because um, no, I was thinking me, about it, because I, I, I look at it too from, hey, what does it look like on, on the on the back end? And I was going to ask a question to Wes about this, but to clarify the point that was just discussed. So um, if you are a real estate professional, yes, you can offset and use all this depreciation, I guess, your active income, your ordinary income, that's the benefit. But also for whatever portion, let's say you throw in money into your own syndication and it is uh, passive um, uh, alongside of your passive investors and the, whatever proportion you split the losses, that piece will go against your passive income. But so your ownership stake and however you split the, the losses will go towards your ordinary income. That's only if you're a real estate professional. If you're not, then then really you can carry forward once you get to one of two things, the maximum of your investment income or, or your passive income across your different asset classes. And then I think it's $3,000 a year that you can go up on top of that. Um, and then if you make less than 150,000 and you know, it phases out at that point, then you can also offset these losses against 25% or $25,000 worth of your active income or your W-2. So there's some benefits there, but I think, uh, you know, this is really hard when you're a syndicator to, to really know all your investors' special situations. And this is where most people will say, hey, you need to talk to your own CPA um, and just being able to provide, yeah, we're doing a cost segregation. And if you invest this amount, this is about how much you're going to get in year one. That should be enough for them to do enough tax planning. Um, and folks are selling and buying new stuff or having deals go full cycle. So, you know, the, we pay for all this appreciation on the backside, which is which just leads me to the question to Wes. Do you also provide like, um, hey, this is all you're taking um, and this is what you would be paying on the, on the back end? for that depreciation recapture. Um, and is there like a sweet spot that you recommend that if you're holding a property less than X number of years, do you suggest we don't do a cost seg or they, or you do, do you have any of those kind of rules of thumb? Yeah, great, great points on passive and active stuff there. I'm happy to share a little more that, uh, on that. Um, rule of thumb, if you're gonna flip the property in less than three years, you're going to be taking a bunch of depreciation up front, but then paying it back pretty quick. Um, you are taxed on the depreciation that you take in, the, in different forms. <clears throat> There's three types. There's the personal property recapture, um, uh, which is 1245 recapture, and then there's the 1250 recapture. We generally don't do a full-blown recapture analysis. I can't think of a time I've done one because that ball has a lot of moving parts to it. Sales price, tax rate, amount that's been taken in depreciation. Um, so it's a very tricky thing to estimate upfront. And awareness of it is, is kind of really what I push my clients towards. Um, I've sort of, I've prepared a, a look at it. I guess now's probably a good a time as any to jump into it. Um, uh, before we do that, let's roll back. I didn't really touch on active and passive. Um, we can certainly do that. Passive losses offset passive income. Active income, I'm sorry, active losses offset everything, including your W-2 uh, income. Um, and so that active thing we're talking about applies specifically to tax treatment and whether or not you meet the bar of an active real estate investor. So the IRS wants to see a couple different things. There's a few different litmus tests for it. The most basic one is 750 hours of material participation if you don't have a W-2. If you're W-2, you're kind of up the creek. They want to see more than half your time. So if you're working as a professional 2,000 hours a year somewhere, the IRS wants you working in your real estate 2,001 hours. And that's, I mean, that's a tough bar to meet for a lot of people. However, many of my clients, especially in the medical field, Will just have their spouse become the real estate professional. Maybe they're, uh, you know, a stay-at-home spouse, and if they can meet that threshold, the, the minimum hour requirements, and then, you know, it's a joint filing. So, the spouse's losses will offset uh, the other spouse's W two. So, there's a lot of ways to go about making cost seg apply 
a really great discussion for a CPA for you to have with your tax pro uh, CPA or otherwise. So let's look at uh, recapture. Where did I hide that? That's not it. I thought I put it in one of these. Yeah, I ran some quick recapture calculations because it's a real thing. And um, if you don't know it's coming, it'll, it can ruin your lunch. I think we might have some ruined lunches on our hands. <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, you really are um, kind of saving it at one rate and then paying it back at another. Goodness. Yeah, while you look for that, I was just thinking, Emma, mean, that was good stuff there. And just from, you know, uh, a syndicator's point of view, or really anybody kind of putting deals together where you have partners, is we usually don't include the cost segregation in the analysis of returns or anything. It is just like, hey, this is our underwriting, this is what it looks like, and oh, by the way, we're doing cost segregation, and here's a sample study prior to actually closing on a deal that gives you some sense of what we might be looking at, and then let individuals talk to their CPA about it, about their particular situation, but it, it never really becomes a conversation in terms of returns. All right, so I'm not seeing it in front of me, but I can run through the calculations with you. It shouldn't be too bad. So I do, yeah, I sworn I had all that thing right here, but unless I don't, oh, you know what? Here it is. Okay, so here's a couple types of recapture. That 1245 recapture that I was talking about, when you sell the property, the 1245 depreciation that you took, which is gonna be five year and seven year, is gonna be recaptured at your ordinary tax rate. Then there's 1250 recapture. And that's bonus depreciation claimed in excess of straight line. So what you should, you're gonna get taxed either way. And that's kind of a, a common misconception people have is that if I don't take depreciation, I won't have to pay a recapture tax, but that's not, all, that's not it at all because the way it's worded is it's the appreciation that you took or the appreciation that you should have taken. And when they talk about should have taken, they're talking about straight line. So in looking at this example here, we've got our total bonus depreciation on 1245 property. So that's the five and seven. So I've summed these two buckets, the 2.9 and the 80K and I apply the top margin tax rate, right? And so that would be the tax at sale on the depreciation on the 1245 component of the depreciation that you took. 1.1 million, I mean, that's a hefty tax bill, but remember now, the total savings there was like 4.1. So the other recapture is the right line of uh, the 15 year and then the structure. So the total 15 year that we had was 1.2 million. And it, so if this was straight line, the 15 year, not the 27 and a half, it would have only been 40,000. And so there's a Delta 1.1 million. And if you tax that at 37%, we got 438K. So what I did here was combine the two, the 1245 and the 1250. So that's all the bonus recapture tax. And then compared it to what it would have been had we never opened the door on cost segregation. We still would have taken a ton of straight line. All this stuff right here, we would have taken or should have taken. And then that would have been taxed at capital gains rate. So the, one of the big differences here is taxing at ordinary income, 37%, or 
cap gain, which can be as high as 25. And so the delta there is 800,000, sizable amount, no, no arguing there. Um, but the things you've got to consider is your first year savings of a, of a million five, what can you do with that? What's the opportunity cost with that kind of money? If you're staring down a recapture tax, also quick note there, that's calculated for a, a five year sale. So not an atypical holding period, um, but I just wanted to let you know that's what it looks like. The longer you go into the hold, the more time value of money comes into play and shrinks this burden. The more, the longer you go into the hold, the more the straight line increases and shrinks that burden. Um, but something Greg alluded to earlier is this is the tax law we have now. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about making cap gain equal to your ordinary income tax rate. And that makes this whole thing a new point because there's no longer a difference between the capital gain rate and the ordinary rate. So, I don't know how this would work out um, in that kind of environment. I'm thinking it would be a wash either way. So a quick look at recapture right there for you guys. Um, hey Wes, this is so up my alley. I love it um, with the deep dive onto the numbers. Um, what did you, I missed this part. What did you have as 1245 property? Uh, was it the five and seven year? Five or and just, seven. Okay, cool. Yeah. The five year buck. Okay, these are the totals down here. It doesn't all show on the screen, but that's a 2.9 and then the, the seven year, which is always pretty small. Um, sorry, combines there to a little over 3 million. And it's that personal property allocation that's going to get hit hard at sale with your ordinary tax rate. The other assets, it's a little different, a little bit of formulatic, formulatic approach there. Um, but that's a, that's a look at, at recapture. It's, it's kind of a, you know, when clients ask, well, why shouldn't I do this? This is the first thing we talk about is recapture. Um, you know, the other reason is if it's going to be a really quick sale, you're just going to pay the depreciation back immediately. So it's the point. Um, but if you're going to put a strategy in place, cost sake certainly has some benefits. So any more questions on this? I'm happy to knock them out while we got it open. Uh, no, you touched on, yeah, I was going to ask about any insight on proposed changes to the law. That might be a little bit of a, of a rat's nest of too many what ifs to get into, but your point was made that there's rumblings of changes to this tax law. So here's what uh, I'm seeing. I, I think I can run through that quickly enough. All right. um, I think that the administration is kind of marching under the ideology of taxing the rich. And so when we see discussions about 1031 going away, that's been around for a hundred years. No kidding. Like it, used to, it started with like farm equipment, exchange this old tractor for a new one, that's tax-free exchange on the gain. Um, you know, then they, they cap it at 400K, um, but there's, you know, bonus appreciation, uh, 1031 exchanges, it's kind of corporate welfare to an extent, so they may go after it. Uh, but as I just read something they put out on Monday, it, it looks like a lot of that language is softening, particularly capital gains rates. They, they looks like they're not going to jack them up as high as I thought they were. Um, so I think we'll be okay. I think we'll still have a reasonable capital gain rate. Uh, moving that to ordinary income tax rate would really slow down transactions quite a bit, I think. I think people would be less incentivized to sell because they'd be under a, a pretty big tax burden. But we'll see where it goes. We'll know pretty quick. It's not going to be long before we get uh, a good read at, at what's going on. So under the current climate, I like it. Under a more tax aggressive climate, I'll probably like that too because the more heavily individuals are taxed, the more they look for ways to avoid it. And that's uh, when my phone starts ringing. So. Let's do this. Um, if you guys want to expand on that, we can. If not, I'll jump into kind of how I look at a, a property um, when I'm on site. Once we get uh, you know engagement from a client, we'll go and walk the property, physically inspect them. And I put together kind of a picture 
go follow what we see. It's a pretty, pretty big complex that I walk. We go in and usually hit the kitchen first. Some items here that you'll see in your caustic study are, of course, the appliance, uh, but also the cabinets. This floor molding down here, you'll catch that as it's something that's accelerated. Uh, the tile, you won't see accelerated. That goes in structure. And all this sheetrock here, that doesn't go in structure. Pretty typical um, apartment kitchen here, electric range. You'll also see accel um, accelerated. And when I say accelerated, I mean move into a short life category. Uh, you'll see the electricity that runs that guy. That becomes a very specific piece of electricity, different from the plug in the living room. That's part considered part of the structure, but the electricity that runs this range and this hood, you'll see as a five-year asset in a cost sex study. Uh, here's another kitchen. Uh, if that looks familiar to you, Greg, it's because I it was going to say that looks extremely familiar. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes we'll see cabinets in the laundry area and also ventilation in the laundry area. I think that's code now in newer places. You got to have the extractor that's typical, typically seen in the bathroom. Uh, galley kitchen, all the same components, the fridge, the range, the hood, the dishwasher, the disposal, all of those will become five-year assets in a good cost of study, as well as the cabinets and the countertops. There's your disposal, there's your dishwasher, there's your hood. Special plumbing for a washer dryer. That gets accelerated and the plug that you plug it into. This is different from the plumbing that you need to take a shower and wash your hands. You don't have to have this to have an apartment. So it's considered specialized. It'll be accelerated. This is the dryer vent kit. The dryer outlet also goes. So these machines, so maybe some of you guys have third-party operators. Uh, we don't count that appliance when we go on site because it doesn't belong to the owner. It belongs to a third party. But the components that run it belong to the property owner. That plumbing is in your wall. That electrical is in your wall. That vent kit is through your wall. The gas is necessary. That's also part of your building. And you'll see that broken out in your cost seg study. There's two types of flooring right here that count, carpet and vinyl. Ceramic, and when I say count, I mean count towards something that will be accelerated. Ceramic tile doesn't. One of the underlying philosophies behind cost seg is, can I remove it and can I reuse it? And the answer is yes here for these. I don't know why you would, but you can, so it's allowed. Uh, ceramic tile, there's no way. You can not uh, you, you can remove it, but once you've removed it, you're not reusing that. It's just a pile of dust and chips. Ceiling fan gets accelerated and the electricity that runs it. That's decorative lighting you see there. This is something different than like a can that you would just see in a, in a living room. Um, so we would accelerate kind of little chandeliers, also sconce lighting along the wall, accelerate that stuff too. All your window blinds, patio blinds, those are going to become five-year. Your wire shelving and your wood shelf and rod in the bathroom, five-year assets. Telephone wiring, five-year asset. This base mold will go into five-year. This is the bathroom. Now we're into stuff that doesn't get accelerated. So you're Vanity, sink, uh, vanity and the sink, that's structural. All the stuff in the shower, got to have it. Part of the structure, it doesn't get accelerated. So now we're outside the building. This is 15-year stuff. The paving, the striping, the curb that you see running along here, all that should be priced out differently in your cost sake study. The pool, the landscaping, the fencing around the pool, 15-year, tennis court, 15-year. Talk about this for just a second. This is a, not just any old pond. This is a stormwater runoff. This had to be dug out in the development. So it's considered a land improvement. It's a very expensive component. Uh, we see this a lot in my area. I mean, Houston, Southeast Texas, it rains a lot, floods a lot. So drainage is put in uh, almost everywhere. These are the catch basins, incredibly expensive machinery here. Channel drain, I'm sorry, uh, assets, not machinery. Uh, channel drains in the parking lot, uh, that'll all be 15-year stuff. There's railing and sidewalks, 15-year assets, more sidewalks, covered parking. Not cheap. A lot, of, uh, a lot of money to put that in and a lot of money going to the 15-year bucket as well. That's sight lighting here, this wall pack. That'll be accelerated. There's a gazebo, your mailboxes. That's one of the few things that goes in 15-year bucket. 
this particular apartment complex had a leasing office. And all of these chairs, tables, the little decorations, if you were to go in and buy this apartment complex tomorrow, this would become part of the number that's in your improvement basis. So we break it all out, segregate it, and you'll see it accounted for in your cost seg study. Uh, there's some crown molding that also gets accelerated. And these windows are inside the building. So they're technically demountable partitions. They don't serve the function of keeping rain out anymore. Um, you'll see those called out as well. There's some shelving, so the gym equipment that'll go into a five-year bucket, the mirror that's back there, all five-year stuff. This is another example of stuff that you just end up acquiring when you buy an apartment complex. There's also a garage in this apartment full of ladders, key machines, small welders, all that stuff will value it and it becomes FF&E, furniture, fixture, and equipment, which is a big line item in a cost safe study. And that one I slid in there. I hope you guys enjoy it. It's my kiddos. Um, he just turned one. She's about to turn three. Uh, they're kind of what makes the world go round. So I thought I'd slide them in there real quick. Not part of a cost safe study. If you see kids in there, alert the authorities. Hey, Wes, I joke <laughs> around and I call them little tax deductions. So, hey, they're about applicable. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, so once we've gone on site and checked out all the components, we make a list of uh, these things. We quantify them, qualify them, uh, and... I'll pop open a report here and kind of show you what I do back at the desk. So this boilerplate stuff, the investor, a little bit about the building when they bought it. Oh, this is all redacted, by the way. None of this is, is real. It's, um, you got to kind of protect my client's privacy here. Um, but it's, uh, what do they call it? Fact-based fiction, something like that. Um, you'll see the purchase price here again in line 24, line 25, backs out the land value, gets to our uh, improvement basis. Now, improvement basis is what's going to get divided. So here's one of the awesome things about cost set. These numbers here are bulk values of what I found on site. It's, it, all the little pieces are rolled up here. And they sum to 15.1 million. But this doesn't get us to your 16 million. So what we do is a, call the purchase price allocation. There's a couple different purchase price allocations. This one is a specific cost seg theory. We've got to mark all these numbers up, right? There's cost and then there's value. You've, I'm sure heard this a number of times as, as an economic principle. And what we're stating here is this is a replacement cost value, a very detailed replacement cost. And we're gonna mark it up to what you paid for. Sometimes we mark this down, which is an excellent indicator of a savvy investor buying something right. Uh, that's essentially, if you see it marked down, they have bought it below replacement value. And that's kind of a, a goal, a tricky one now in, in today's climate, but a goal of investors to buy it as cheap as possible. Um, so it's marked up by this factor right here. So quite a bit of math that goes into that one, but it's marking everything up 5.8%. And now our 5, 7, 15, 27 and a half year values, they no longer equal 15 million equal. 16 million, which is your improvement basis. So that's another one of those little sneaky ways of how uh, you know, real estate cost and value uh, are worth different things to investors. So to continue with what's in my report, from just basic land value, but you'll see all of the values here. We quantified it. We've got you know, 160,000 square feet of carpeting in this joint. We're assigning a value to it. Uh, there's some cost per square foot in here uh, that you're not seeing. There's also, we account for the region that it's in. It costs a lot more to build in Los Angeles and New York than it does in you know, Eastern Tennessee or my neck of the woods. Um, but also there's places that's cheaper. So sometimes we mark up a baseline cost based on where it is. Sometimes we mark it down based on where it is. We also account for uh, different consumer price indices. You guys are familiar with the way uh, lumber behaved over the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, so we, we track all that stuff and we apply factors to the quantity 
that end up giving us this value. So there's some more stuff that goes on in here, but I don't want to bog it down in the detail. So, you know, each unit has got the range, the hood, the dishwasher, you see those now in your cost egg study, uh, mirrors in the bathroom, the telephone and computer wiring that we talked about. There's our 15 year stuff, asphalt paving, concrete paving, There's our storm water system. I mentioned that being expensive, but just, I just uh, run a quick sum on it, 140,000 going into the 15 year bucket just on that stuff. There's our pool, those are never cheap. And then we've got structure, foundation, slabs, windows are gonna be in here. Um, this one, we did it by building and by uh, unit configurations, because there were so many different ones. It's all the stuff in the clubhouse that we talked about. All goes into its respective bucket. I give this spreadsheet in my report, it consolidates those. Um, we talked about carpeting. That's just one piece of the flooring. Well, I guess appliances is probably a better example than carpeting, but like the refrigerator is appliance, the oven is an appliance, the hood is an appliance. You get the idea. When you look here, you'll just see one number for appliances. So it consolidates. This is a consolidated view of all these different components. They still have the five-year total, 3.95, that ties back to right there. So consolidated by category, five, seven, 15, 27 and a half year. And then we've got the final summary. We saw this earlier. We'll take a look at it again. It's no longer estimated percentages here. These are the actual percentages. Um, we beat the estimate on this one. Um, anytime I see apartments that include washers and dryers, that five-year number's going up. Um, we don't always estimate that they will include those. Um, you know, if we walk in and the place is just wall-to-wall -wall ceramic tile, maybe we're not going to hit our estimate. Flooring is a big bucket. Um, and the same applies outside. When we go on site and we see elaborate storm drainage, really nice fencing. And the quality also comes into play here. Uh, there may be deferred maintenance, which allows us to adjust our pricing down, or it may be very well maintained. and We don't adjust it down as much. Um, so we'll kick out that final benefit. Uh, 5.9 million is what they're gonna see on a loss. Throw that top margin tax rate at it in this cost of study. We're saving our client 2.1 million in year one. Um, a final study is gonna look something like this. Page one, just the overview. This is a cover letter that breaks out those buckets of value that we talked about. Um, then there's all the data you'll get. Oh, this is the whole spreadsheet right here printed out. There's a consolidated page we went over. There's your final uh, benefit broken out by tax year, kind of give you a look at what you can expect, not only in this current year of acquisition, but in subsequent years moving forward. And then, uh, tax info, a quick look at what I talked about earlier, pulling the tax record, checking out the land and improvement percentage. So this is not the tax record for this property. I just wanna make that point, but I'll show you quickly how we would make that calculation. Here is your land value. So we'd go 3020995. Here's your total value. So we divide it by 28,858,200. Land here is 10.46%. I take this 10.46% and apply it to whatever you paid for the property. And now you know what your land value is. And the equation becomes what you paid minus your land gives you the improvement basis. The improvement basis is what gets segregated. So that's just the DENDA data um, in the report. You should also expect some type of description, a quick write-up this apartment at such and such an address, so many units, so many square feet. Uh, brief description about the interior, the electrical service systems, 
don't expect much here. It's not an inspection report, or those are many pages long uh, with property specific data. This is just kind of an overview. And then, um, you know, your picture page, that'll also be in the report. And there's um, then the boilerplate stuff. I talked about case law uh, earlier. I referenced a lot of it in my report. It's going to be yeah, down here. Like, here's a carpet and padding. It tells you the court case that kind of usher that in when it happens, ceiling fans, just different items that are called out through years of adjudication. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Cost seg uh, 101. Actually, this is probably 102, a little more advanced course. Uh, I have a question. Do it. Uh, whereas if, if my, my CPA uh, is probably not, not able uh, to do something like this, <laughs> and, and, and you said, right, it's anyway a specialty. So, so he's not going to be miffed if, if, if I bring, bring in you, for example, right? He may be happy that you brought in me. Oftentimes, tax professionals want a layer between them and a cost seg study. Um, if it's called into question, under audit, any good cost seg firm will defend this on their dime. Uh, it's in my service agreement um, that I'll do it. I'll, all the way, if it gets to the court, I'll serve as an expert witness test. Uh, many CPAs don't want to do this. It's not that they can't figure it out. It's that they make their money being tax professionals. Cost seg is kind of a blend between construction knowledge and a very specific tax knowledge. Uh, so you'll probably like it that you bring in uh, a pro to do your cost seg study. There are bigger firms that offer this in-house, uh, but be prepared to pay accordingly. Uh, so now I don't think they'd be missed at all. A good study is going to have backup detail, um, which still enjoy. It gives uh, them a couple different looks at your study. They may enter in your depreciation schedule the lump sums that we see at the top. And then with uh, one more question that was anyway, you said anonymized, right? Uh, would you be able to, to distribute this or is that not possible? Distribute, what do you mean? Do you want, do you want a copy? Send it to me. Yeah, send, send me a, yeah. a copy of this. This is a, a mock study. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to send this. And this, the recording will also be posted to the YouTube so channel can, as well. I, 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 I write my uh, email in, in the chat. Okay. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um, happy to send it. I mean, it's, it's made up. It doesn't have any confidential information in it. It doesn't have anything proprietary in it. It's just a basic study that I provide. Uh, more than happy to send it along. Excellent. All right. I've got it here. I'll go ahead and forward that on to you, Wes. Yeah, thanks. All right, we are just at over an hour. Does anybody have any other questions for what well, we've got Wes here? Everybody is quiet. All right. Maybe I explained it well. Maybe you I explained it well. There's a lot to there's a lot to it. There's a lot to digest there's, there for sure. Oh, yeah, bit. absolutely. All right, well, if there's no questions, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Wes, for spending your Wednesday or Tuesday evening with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. All of you, uh, I appreciate it. I know we have all, all have other things um, you know, we could do with an hour in our evening and, and that you chose to give that time to, uh, to me and Greg and Kim. I really appreciate it. Yep. I feel the exact same way. Thank you so much. Um, our next meetup is going to be in person. So we are on the 28th of September at the Tennessee Hills Brew Stillery in Johnson City. So we hope to see you there. And thanks again, everybody.